Well, look, so some of you that have not maybe uh, been with us that long or for the last five years, it seems like it's been about five years. I was traveling. I've, I've, I've taught the, the Bible this way since we've had the church, at least for a couple of different times where we went through the whole Bible, right? And, um, and, and you may not even realize, but about five years ago, my next, you won't remember, but I remember, my next place to go was First Chronicles. And I left where I was and I went to the New Testament. Then we got to the, we got to the end time stuff and we went back to Daniel and then we went into the book of Revelation. So I think that's taken us anywhere from three to four years to, to go there. And so I just felt led in my heart to, to go back where we were. But I'm not going to be as dark dogmatic about it. I'm just going to let the Lord lead and guide and, and flow. Amen. One of the things though I do want to tell you is, and I want us to all, hopefully we can all at least understand and try to be on the same page on how, you know, how God moves. We, we Listen, we're all constantly growing in our understanding of God and how he moves and how he desires to do what he desires to do. You know, we've been praying and crying out that the Lord would begin to really move in our, in our services and that the gifts of the spirit would begin to flow. And, and I do believe that God is definitely moving. And I believe that this is just the beginning of what he wants to do. He, you know, one thing I will say though, is, is when I say all on the same page, I want, I want everybody to understand where we've come from and how this church was actually established so that we'll understand, you know what I'm saying, where we're going, moving forward. Um, one of the things that I did not know, and I've, I know I've shared many times with you about what happened to me in that barroom experience, but the specific word that the Lord spoke to me was this, present my word for the way that it is written, and then I will use you. Now, the problem that I had encountered in the past, just to let you know, I had been, go I had been in church for, well, at least at least 12 years up until that point. I had been in a church in Berwick for two years and I had been to another church for 13 years. And the, the, one of the churches that I went to was very, what, what you would call a prophetic type church, okay? And, and so, and it, but, but anyway, the way, there wasn't a lot of word that was brought forth. Like a, there wasn't a lot of Bible teaching, okay? I'm not, scriptures were read, but, but the people did not understand the word of God in that church. And what was, what happened is, is that almost every service there was altar calls and people would go, come up to the altar. There would be lines of people at the altar. And I'm just going to, I'm just wanting to be real with you. I believe in people getting slain in the Holy Spirit. I want you to know, and I believe that whenever we had that service here, that some people that were slain, like it was, it was legit. And the Lord really ministered to people. And so look, I'm all about it. I, but I've admitted to you that, I, that through the years, I've gotten kind of jaded and a little bit critical because I've also experienced some stuff that wasn't real. I've had men of God press so hard on my head, like, and I'm thinking to myself, dude, I ain't going, 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 I ain't going. in that barroom bathroom and spoke to me, he revealed, I didn't know what he was really saying that night. But what I have learned through the years is this, my word, you see in the book of Hosea, I was listening, I was thinking about Hosea today. And, um, in the book of Hosea in chapter four, he said, my people perish for lack of knowledge. And then he went on to say this. He said, he said, and he speaks specifically to the priests. And he says, because you have rejected knowledge, I have rejected you. And so listen, I mean, I'm not, I'm not a man that wears a, a collar because that's not even what a priest looked like back then. Well, they, whatever, they did have their garb that they wore. But I would think that as a pastor or a preacher or a teacher of the word of God, that to some extent that word still is alive for me today. And I don't want to be rejected by the Lord. And I definitely don't want to reject knowledge. And I want the people of God to be able to understand the word of God. Amen. Uh, and one, one thing that I will say too, that God has, uh, because I'm just trying to get us all on on the same page moving forward. Listen, we've been praying for the gifts of the spirit to move and for the moving and operation. Why? Because that's what the church is supposed to look like. But let me just say this. I don't, I want a church like Acts, but I don't want a church like Corinth. Can I say that again? I want a church. And listen, I'm not picking on the, well, I'm kind of picking on the Corinthians because the apostle Paul had to poke them a little bit. You do understand that's why we have all that knowledge about the gifts of the spirit because the church of Corinth was, they were operating in the gifts 
gifts, and we've already said this a couple of times, the Bible says you come behind no one in the gifts, but you're carnal. And, and like you're over here like, well, I kind of like the way Brother Kirk does it, and I, 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 I like the way Brother Matt does it, or I, I, I kind of like the way, like, you know, when you brought Dustin Miller in here, man, he was, he was fire. And, and, you know, when you, when you brought, you know, such and such, I like Lauren's teaching better. I, 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 I like Donnie. Yeah, he, he might come across this way, but I kind of like that. You know what? The Lord just, you know what Paul said? I would that we'd all speak the same thing. Now, this is the thing. You're going to always like one person's personality a little bit bit better than another because your mind and your heart might flow that way. And there's nothing wrong with that. But what we really want is to be one mind, one accord, and we really want to be in unity. And we want to make sure that we're teaching, we're teaching the truth and that people are receiving the truth, right? Amen. One time though, I will say this about the gifts of the spirit. Boy, I got to figure out how to say this the right way because I don't want to sound wrong. <laughs> There's been times in my life in those early years of, as a Christian, because again, I want to make it clear that I've been in very, what church services that called themselves prophetic. Um, and there was just words flowing all over the place. And whenever nothing was really ever being changed and then the Lord showed up and what happened was he all of a sudden supernaturally placed the love of his word in my heart. And that's what began to change me. The word of God began to change me on the inside. It became alive on the inside of me. And it became, it began to wash my mind, if you will. And it began to cleanse my heart. And I began to really understand the things of God. Okay. And one time I can remember, I don't remember where I was, but I remember the Lord spoke this to my spirit. The Lord said, you know, son, people will run to and fro looking for a manifestation. People will run to and fro looking for a word. They'll stand in lines. They'll drive for three to four hours. But let me just say this to you as you're on your knees, four o'clock in the morning, seeking my face and my presence is ministering to you. And then you're going to turn and you're going to crack open my word. I'm going to be speaking words to you. I'm going to be speaking words of knowledge to you. I'm going to be speaking words of wisdom to you. Listen, the word of God, sometimes I'll be driving down the road and all of a sudden something will happen and the Lord will drop a, a scripture in my heart or somebody will say something and the Lord immediately drops a scripture in my heart. And I don't know about you, but what I'm trying to tell you is, is that my, what I'm discerning here is that the Lord is constantly dropping words of knowledge and words of wisdom that are out of this word right here, messages that he's speaking to me personally. Now, I, I believe that the, gift of the, that the gifts in the church, whenever a word of wisdom is an utterance word, then that's a word that he gives to me for you, but he's giving me words of wisdom all the time. And I'm like, hallelujah, Lord. I don't want to have to drive four hours. If you're going to speak to me, speak, Lord, speak, word of God, speak. I want the word of God to speak to me. Amen. And what I will say is this. One thing that I am not interested in is exchanging words of knowledge for the knowledge of the word. And I'm not interested in exchanging words of wisdom for the wisdom of the word. Amen. What I want is I want both flowing. Amen. So with that said, praise God, we're going to get into First Chronicles. Now, let me just tell you a little bit about First Chronicles. First Chronicles was written, most commentators or scholars believe, by Ezra. Ezra was known as a priest and a scribe. What is a scribe? It's a deep, deep a person that has great depth of understanding of the scriptures. And a priest is a person that would offer up the sacrifices or comes typically from the tribe of Levi. We'll get into that a little bit in a moment. But the point that I want to make to you, I don't want to give you, wear you down too much with information, but Ezra, the time frame of Ezra, if you don't know or you don't remember, and that's why these things are important because one of the, one of the things that has really flourished in my heart and in my life through understanding the word wasn't just reading scripture, but understanding the time frame and the context and understanding where these things are flowing in the midst of all of this because the people of God are going through some things throughout the word of God and it's where they are and what they're going through when God begins to speak that changes things and if we can understand that guess what it will help you and I for today so Ezra during this time frame wh where he is is after what you would call the Babylonian and the Persian and the and the really after the Babylonian captivity. Okay, y'all remember that story, right? When they, whenever ba Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, went. And if you don't remember the story, it's okay. I want to encourage you. Like, I don't want you to walk out of here today and be like, man, this dude done gave me so much information and I don't even know what he's talking about. Good, just keep coming back. 
Yeah, I mean, look, I don't mean to pick on Bridget, but well, not pick on her, but I'll use her because she's encouraged me at least four different times. She said, Matt, I've been serving the Lord all my life. I've been going to church all my life. And she's like, I've been reading the Bible all my life. Like, I guarantee you look at some of her old Bible Bibles, they tattered and torn and highlighted and wrote in. And all, I've been knowing Bridget since they had a Bible study at my sister's house when I first stumbled up in that house, like however many years ago that was. And Bridget said this, in the three years I've been here, I done learned more about the Word of God than I have uh, in my whole walk with God. Listen, that may not mean much to some people, but I'm here to tell you, I want to know everything that I can know about God's Word because I want God's Word to speak to me and to bring me stability in my life. I want my house to be built upon a rock. I don't want my house built upon shifting sand. If you build your house upon this world and the information of this world, you will be like everyone else. And whenever the times come that it's hard, the tribulus, the tribulation comes, the frustrations, the irritations, you're going to, you're going to be, it's going to be like an earthquake. You're not going to be able to stand. But if your house is built on the rock, which is Christ Jesus, upon which this word speaks, you will stand in the midst of the storm. Amen. So I just wanted to say that Ezra was a scribe and a priest. He is released. Okay, so Babylonian captivity, Persian captivity, Daniel prophesied about all of this. At some point in time, God begins to release the people of Israel back into the land to begin. Nehemiah rebuilds the, the, the gates, okay, the wall, and Ezra is given the permission to go back and to begin to rebuild the temple. Hallelujah. Man, there's this group, beautiful story in, in, in Ezra where they find the law, the book of the law. He builds himself a pulpit and he just reads the word of God for hours all that day. And the people just stand there listening to the word of God, weeping and weeping and weeping because they had been away from the word of God for so long that they forgot. They didn't have their compass anymore. They didn't know the word of God and they thought that they were doing okay. They thought they were living for God, but they weren't no more living for God than the man. Than the, than the man on the moon. They, they had forsaken the Lord and forsaken his ways. At some point in time, Israel, the northern kingdom, had a share of poles. Oh my gosh. The wickedness. It's like a male phallus. It's a male member up in the church. And they're worshiping these things and they're calling it Yahweh. <laughs> what? That's what happens whenever we don't understand the word of God. We can, be, we can be tossed to and fro like a wave on the ocean. And so Ezra, so, so listen, I want you to understand the time frame. Whenever Ezra writes this, he's writing after the Babylonian captivity. He's writing after all the prophets warned Israel. He's writing after they didn't listen. He's writing after they go into captivity. And now God's starting to show some mercy. So what does he do? do he writes one of the books that you don't want to read. He writes one of the books that... Early on in my Christianity, I was like, oh my gosh, how many more names is he going to write down here? How much more genealogy is it going to be? But, he, but you know why he's doing that? Because he wants the people to be reminded who they are, what, what, that, God is, that God is their father, amen, and that they went the wrong way and that this is what happened, but God is yet merciful and kind and good, and he's bringing them back into the land. And he, so he starts off in in the beginning, in the beginning where the people of God should know the story of God, okay? That's why it's important for you and I to understand these things. It's important that we understand, I've been, this has really been on my heart lately since I preached that message out of Hebrews, a cloud of witnesses has gone before us. And recently we talked about John Wesley and we talked about Charles Wesley, and I think that's just a couple hundred years ago. And then the other day I mentioned John Knox in the 1500s. They had grooves on the floor of his, uh, the wooden floor from all the praying he was doing. Guess what? These are witnesses just two, three, four hundred years ago. But look, these witnesses, it goes all the way back to Adam. The people of God goes all the way back to Adam because God created Adam. And, and the people of God that are, in, that are from Israel during these time frames are supposed to know these stories. And you and I as believers and the people of God are supposed to know these stories. Now listen, it takes time. Let me, be, let me remind you again, the journey of Christianity is a process. It's not going to happen overnight. My prayer for you is that you would fall in love with the things of God, the word of God, the presence of God. Amen. And that you would desire his word. 
and that you would begin to put it in you. So from Adam to Noah, we know the story. This is where, this is where creation comes, but this is where the fall takes place. And we know the wickedness that's on the earth and that God had to destroy the earth. But from the one man, Noah, he brought offspring on the other side. There's hope. Even though there's judgment, there's hope, and we see the sons of, so I'm just really going to streamline this for you, okay? And, so we, and I'm, just, I'm just hitting the highlights, I mean, but I'm going to want to make a point that, because look, the first nine chapters of First Chronicles is nothing but genealogy. I'm giving you like just one little page of it, okay? Because I'm I'm I want to dig it out and I want to give you the high point so that we can make some, make some progress with this. So Noah's son was Shem, Ham, and Japheth. And then from there, look, Ham had a son named Nimrod. It's important for us to also understand the other side to some extent because I need you to understand something. There's only two kinds of people on the earth. There's not multiple kinds of people. There's not Muslims and Buddhists and, you know, Jews and, you know, uh, different color people's skin. You got, you know, people that have darker skin and you got people that have lighter skin and all this. No, no, no. There's only two kinds of people on the earth. I don't care what the world tells you. There's only two. One is desiring to serve the Lord and the other is not serving God. Now, some of those people that are not serving God really They think they are, and I don't mean that judgmentally or critically, but they think they are and they want to, but there's only really two types of people on the earth. And I really believe that if you showed up in this place tonight, you're one of, you're the type of person that wants to serve the Lord. Amen. And so in order for us to understand that, so Nimrod began a rebellion and I don't really have time to get into it, but Nimrod began a rebellion that that resulted, if you will, in the tower of Babel. And some of the things that we have been studying out here recently is that, listen, the whole world except for Israel at the time was against God and and hallelujah through all of these years God has created a people and this is where we are today okay but Ham had Nimrod and then look at this Shem which was also one of Noah's sons right there had a son named Heber okay now from Heber we get Abraham All right. So we know the story of Abraham, right? Most of you should, if you don't know the story of Abraham, Abraham is such an important character in the Bible. And why? Because see, Abraham was just like everybody else in the world. As a matter of fact, his father, the Bible says his father was a maker of idols. And God called Abraham and said to him, he said, come out of your father's house and I'm going to make you a nation. And I'm going to bless those who bless you, curse those who curse you. And through your seed, all nations of the earth shall be blessed. Don't ever get tired of the story, my friend. It's a beautiful story. That it's a, no, it's a real story. Do you hear what I'm trying to tell you? That little spot you got in your heart right now that drove you to come to church, that's part of this story right here. God is moving and operating upon this earth. He's doing something. And sometimes we've got to dig in order to be able to see it. Amen. So from Abraham, though, he has two sons, Isaac and Ishmael. Look, you can still see the descendants of Ishmael today. That's, that's Islam. It came later on in time. We don't have time. Islam didn't start till 600 AD. But that's another story for another time. But that was the descendants, the Ishmaelites. They were Bedouins riding on camels in the midst of the desert. Muhammad was one of them. And then the story goes, and it's a long story. And we don't have time for that. But what I want you to know is that Isaac was the promised seed. You know the beauty of the story of Isaac, that he was a supernatural offspring. You remember that? Abraham was 99. Sarah was 90. Her womb was barren. The Lord said, she's going to be with child. What did she do? She busted out laughing in the tent. Okay, and then, and then they try to produce offspring with Hagar, the Egyptian woman, and they get Ishmael. The Lord said, no, that's not your offspring. His name shall be called Isaac. And so a supernatural seed is produced. And if you remember the story, God, the, God told Abraham to offer Isaac up on a mountain. Remember that? Y'all know the story, Genesis chapter 22. And, and the Bible says that Abraham put wood on the lad's back. Oh, come on, man. You can't get no better than that. And the lad carries the wood up the hill. And at the last moment, what happens? God provides a ram in the thicket and stays the hand of Abraham. And what is that place now called? Jehovah Jireh. God, my provider. What did God provide that day? He provided a sacrifice. 
God said, you don't have to do that, Abraham. You don't have to offer up your supernatural offspring. You don't have to offer up your, your only begotten son because, look, God didn't recognize an Ishmael because that's a work of the flesh, my friend. Your only begotten son, you don't have to offer him up on, the, on this altar of sacrifice. Why? Because I'm going to send my only begotten son, and he also will carry wood up a hill, and he will be a sacrifice. I'm going to provide a sacrifice for, for the entirety of the human race. And Isaac had two sons, Esau and Jacob. And Jacob's name was changed to Israel. Y'all know this story, right? And Jacob's name was changed to Israel. And from him came the 12 tribes, the 12 tribes of Israel, right? And listen, this is really where we're needing to get right here. So I'm, I'm almost done with the genealogy, okay? So just work with me here. This is really where we needed to get because see the chronicler, the scribe known as Ezra is trying to bring the people of God back to this place right here, Levi and Judah. Levi is the third born child of Leah and Jacob way back in the day. You understand? Listen, I want you to under, try to understand this. Imagine who your, who your great, 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 great grandma is. You don't know. I don't know who my great, 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 I know who my great grandmother was. I don't remember her first name, but she was a little 411, maybe 49 old lady named, named something Broussard. And she had a husband that was about 6'3", and his name was Tojan Broussard. And that's about as far back in my family tree that I go. Okay, but these people kept track of that because God wanted them to know who they were, where they were from, and what their purpose was. And so the origination of the tribes comes from the offspring of Leah and Jacob and, and also Jacob and Rachel and also the, 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 the handmaidens there. But the third child born to, Le, to Leah and Jacob is Levi, and the fourth child born to Judah is Levi. Now imagine hundreds of years of offspring. Oh, where you, hey, what's up, Ronnie? Where you, where you come from, boy? Where's your clan? Oh, we come, we come from Judah. Okay. Oh, hey, hey, Bobby, where, where you, where, where, what tribe you come from? We, 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 come, we come from Levi. I'm going ha- to be a Levite one day. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to walk in the ministry of the Levitical priesthood one day. Oh, man. You, so you, but you said you're from Judah? Man, I know what your great great grandpa said about y'all. See, Jacob, you may, you understand the Jacob prophecy in Genesis forty nine. You might not, so let me tell you about it. The Jacob prophecy in Genesis forty nine. He laid hands on all his boys and he spoke a prophecy over their life. You know what he said about Judah? He said Judah is a lion's whelp, meaning a a, a baby lion. The baby got to grow. The process and the journey of Christianity has been in a growth process. Jesus is known as the lion of the tribe of Judah. Listen, I'm talking about 4,000 years or 2,000 years before Jesus is ever on the scene. Jacob's over there prophesying over his boys, and he lays his hand upon his son named Judah, and he said Judah is a lion's whelp. In other words, from Judah comes the lion, and he also said this, the scepter shall not depart from Judah till Shiloh comes. What is a scepter? It's a king's staff. Jacob prophesied over his son. I've heard prophets say before, if, if, if Saul would have just done what the Lord wanted him to do, he'd have been king forever. No, sir, that's not true. Because listen, that can't be true. So, so don't bring your lying prophecy to me. Now, I didn't know this at the time, and maybe that brother didn't really know it, but let me just say this. Let me, be, let me calm it down a little bit, and let me just say this, that it can't be true that God's plan was for Saul to rule as king, because before Saul was ever born, Jacob laid his hand on Judah and said, the scepter shall not depart. So it wasn't God's will that Saul was ever king. Instead, that was the people's will. So Judah is the tribe from which the king would come, and Levi is the tribe from which the priests would come. So that's who we're going to talk about a little bit here. But look, so from them come the priests, and from Judah comes the kings. All right, so let's break that down a little bit more. So Levi, the first ones of note. Now, there were many, many people born between Levi and Moses and Aaron. Really and truly, Levi was probably born somewhere around 2000 B.C., and Moses and Aaron are somewhere around 1450 B.C. So we're looking at somewhere about 400 years. Does that make sense? So a lot of people have been born. But look, these are two prominent people that show up on the scene. Because see, God's about to bring them into the promised land. And he's preparing a form of worship. 
Amen? He's prepared a form of worship. And one of the things, I'm going to kind of do a little something with Aaron right here. I want to blow him up a little bit because, look, I want you to understand Moses was the prophet. Aaron was the priest. And, look, every, every priest was a Levite, but not every Levite could be a high priest. So when you, come, you had to come from the tribe of Levi, but in order to be a high priest, you had to be a descendant of Aaron. So for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years, they knew who their pedigree was. They knew where they came from because see, look, Zechariah, he comes from the, the tribe of Levi. Who's Zechariah? That was John the Baptist's father. That whenever he was burning incense, it was time for him to burn incense. And he's in there, he's doing his duty. Both he and Elizabeth were from the tribe of Levi. They knew who they were. This is 2,000 years later, okay? Because God, and so Ezra is reminding the children of Israel this is who you are. You belong to the God of glory. You have a heritage. You are connected to him. You are his family. You are his people. And listen, what I'm trying to tell you tonight is that is you. That is me. We are the people of God. Well, how did that happen? I wasn't born a Jew. Oh, no, you was. You were because, see, those that are of faith are the seed of Abraham. Hallelujah. God called Abraham, but the ultimate plan was that he called Abraham before there was ever a law, before there was ever uh, Israel, because Abraham was their, gra their granddaddy. <laughs> so before, and, and the plan was through faith. Abraham believed God and what? It was counted unto him as righteousness. And now you are the household of faith. You are the seed of Abraham through faith in Christ because that is the fulfillment of the manifestation. Amen? Under the kings, we got Judah and then this is it right here. Well, oh man, David. A man after God's own heart right there. A man after God's own heart. How do, you know, do you have a problem with that? I just want to, I just want to, I don't, I'm not asking you to throw your hand up and say, yes, I do, preacher. I have a problem with that because look, David was an adulterous murderer and I've never committed adultery and I've never committed murder. And so why would the Bible say that David was a man after God's own heart? Because David was a real man, dude. And David loved God with everything that was in him. And David didn't have no time to be playing around with no worldly gods. David did not have no time to be messing around with those women that worship Molech. David didn't have no time to be messing around with those women that worship Chemosh. David didn't have no time to be messing around with them Egyptian women. Why not? Because the Lord told him not to. Don't mess with those women. Don't marry those women because they will draw your heart away from me. Now, child of God, I got to tell you that that truth is still alive today. If you are a woman of God or a man of God and you know God and you go actively find yourself a man that ain't serving God or a woman that ain't serving God, nah, that's a bad plan, my friend. Can it work? Yeah, God, don't put God in a box, but it ain't his will. And, and there's going to be a whole lot of heartache, amen? And I'm not saying that you can't come up here and get a quick fix because the Lord is able, but more than likely, you're going to be on a little bit of a journey, my friend. So go ahead and put your seatbelt on and get locked in there because, look, it ain't going to go the way you expected it to go. And if you're not careful, you might have made that decision based on lust. Sometimes, look, the angel of light, boy, it make lust look like love. Oh, but it feels so good. It feels so right. Uh, yeah, we'll be able to go back to the word. Anyway, kings and priests. All right, kings and priests, Jew to David, and from David comes Jesus. And look, I want you to see that, us. Because you may not be able to read it, but that's what it says, us. David was the promise, David was the king. Jesus, David was a type of Jesus. Jesus came from the lineage of David. So look, David came from Judah, but even more specifically, you know how many thousands of different people came from Judah? But more specifically, the prophecy fell upon David. Jesus came from the lineage of David through Joseph, all right? And Mary came through the lineage of David through Nathan, all right? So the point being is this, is that the kings, because that's what we're talking about, because see, that's what First Chronicles is all about, to remind the people of God after they've been through the things that they've been through, to remind them, listen, you, 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 you found yourself 
hitting every bump on the road. You made all kinds of mistakes. You fell into all kinds of sin. You opened up all the wrong doors. It led you to captivity and it led you to bondage. But now you're coming out. Now the Lord has heard your cry and the Lord wants to open up the door and he wants to bless you with his presence. He's going to let the wall be rebuilt. He's going to let the temple be rebuilt. He's going to let the worship begin, the sacrifice to begin again. You need to understand that we are the people of God and that we have been the kings and priests upon the earth that God has given us the kings and priests. So under the priests, we have Levi and like I already told you, Aaron. And then look at this, Jesus right here. Jesus is ultimately the priest. Now his priestly ministry did not start until his resurrection. This is a very interesting thing. And look, I don't expect you to remember all this, but the Lord's going to speak something to you tonight. Amen. Amen. And then us. And I'm going to explain this here in a second. But look, I want you to see this right here. Melchizedek. Oh, Mel what? (laughs) Have you ever heard of that guy before? I know some of y'all have. Melchizedek. Let's go ahead and just take a look at something real quick. Because I think we're going to talk a little bit more about Melky next week. Melchizedek. All right. This is a compound word. Right here. We split it right here in half. This word milk in the Hebrew is the word king. And this word zedek, does anybody know what that word means? Huh? Somebody said it, I think. No, but, 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 how, who, what? Yes, who said that? Nice. Righteousness. Now, does anybody remember what he was king of? He was, huh? Salem. Melchizedek, king of righteousness, king of Salem. Does anybody know what Salem was? Jerusalem, Jerusalem ancient Jerusalem. What is, does anybody know what Se- Jerusalem means? Peace. King of righteousness, king of peace. Listen, this is during the time of Abraham. This is 2,000 years before Jesus would ever show up on the scene. God says the Aaronic priesthood is not going to work because I'm going to call one from another uh, priestly line, and I'm just going to go ahead and throw him into the narrative. His name is Melchizedek. And, and listen, and he, from out of that order of priesthood shall, the, shall he come. All right, and and look, there's a lot to be said about Melchizedek, but we're not getting into that tonight. But I wanted you to see the kings and the priests of Israel, the people of God upon the face of the earth. And in us, now let's take a look at this. Let's just make a quick connection and then we're gonna move forward with the Chronicle. Revelation 5, 5. One of the elders said, now, so this is at the end of the age, right? The book of Revelation tells us he's wrapping it up. Amen. That's what the book of Revelation simplified says. He's wrapping it up. He's bringing it in. in. All the rebels are going to be judged and all the people that worshiped and followed after God are going to be blessed. Blessed with what? Blessed with what? Come. Even so, come. Lord Jesus, come. One day you and I are going to be in the presence of the living king. Amen. I, I don't know about you, but I'm excited about that. Oh, but I still want to see them grandkids. Oh, come on, man. You don't need, look, the Lord will bless you with grandkids if that's his will, but you, man, we're talking about the king of kings and the Lord of lords. We're talking about being in the presence of the holy one of Israel. We're talking about no more tears, no more pain, no more sorrow, Lord. Cause our heart to desire more of you. So here's the timing. This is where we are. One of the elders is, and we know what it's saying is everybody's weeping in heaven right here. If you go back and you read the context, John's up there. He's got a vision, man. The Lord done pulled him up in the spirit. And he's getting this vision right here. He says, everybody's just weeping. And the reason that they're weeping is because nobody could open the scroll, the seal. Nobody could crack the seal to get everything really started here. Oh, Lord, we done lost it. Let's see if we're going to be able to fix it. Probably not because it's acting crazy. But anyway, you get some of the points, right? Let's see if it works. All right, here we go. Help us, Lord. We can, we can operate without electronic devices, but help us, Lord. (laughs) So he says, and one of the elders said to me, weep no more. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David. Isn't that good? 
has conquered so that he can open the scroll and its seven seals. You don't have to weep because he was saying nobody in heaven, nobody on earth was worthy to open the seals. Everybody's just weeping because we're just stuck here. We're stuck here in a situation that the enemy is still has power on earth. But I got to tell you something. Look, the enemy might have power on earth, but he's not supposed to have power over us. Amen. The enemy is not supposed to have power over us. You and I are supposed to be able to walk in victory and in the authority of our king. Hallelujah. So he says he has conquered so that he can open the the scrolls. Now look at this. They sang a new song. Here you go. And they sang a new song saying, worthy are you to take the scroll to open its seals for you were slain and by your blood you ransomed people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. Boy, there's a lot that could be said about that, but let me just say this. He purchased us with his blood. He purchased a people with his blood. That's why you have, there's no other way to get to the Lord. You got to have faith in Christ and what he did for you on the cross. There's no other access way. He said, I am the door to the sheep. Anybody that tries to get in another way is a thief and a robber. Look at this verse. And you have made them a kingdom. Now this is the ESV version. I'm about to give you the King James because I, I think that it's important, but I think, it's, I think they're both true. Because the word basilia, I didn't really look it up in the Greek, but I'm pretty sure that's the right word. The word basilia, where we get basilica, which has to do with like a reign, like a reign of a king, can be translated in English as either kingdom or as kings. All right? So it says, and you have made them a kingdom. But is that not true that God is making a kingdom? And at this time, is he not going to, at this time, going to bring his kingdom upon the earth? Amen. He says, you have made them a kingdom and priests to our God, and they shall reign on the earth. Now, look, I wanted to go ahead and show you that in the King James, it says kings. So what I'm trying to tell you is I'm trying to show you the connection that God has been creating a people on the earth. And through that people, Israel, he gave the world, he gave Israel kings and priests. But I got to tell you that the fulfillment of that is that you and I are also called to be kings and priests. Amen. And that what do kings do? Kings walk in authority. Kings walk in authority in their kingdom. Amen. And what do priests do? They minister to the people of God. I want you to know that, the, that you are a king and priest unto God. It, it, le, le, whether you see yourself or not is not the issue. I'm telling you what the word of God says. The word of God. Now, look, this is talking about the future in that we will rule and reign with him during the millennial reign of Christ. But let me just say this. The kingdom of God is deposited in us right now. And let me just say this. God wants you and I to walk in kingdom authority. Amen. God wants you and I to be able to walk Walk in the victory that Christ has won for us. Amen. So we need to start getting our head right and start understanding who we are in Christ. Amen. And to understand that in him, there is nothing impossible. Because hallelujah. Let me tell you something too. Look, God wants people free. (laughs) God wants to show up. God wants to deliver. He wants to set free. Why? Because he wants to get the glory so that more people can be added to the kingdom. Amen. We don't really, look, should we pray here? Yeah, we better. As a matter of fact, while I'm saying that, because I meant to say it earlier, if it's possible, Tuesday nights could be a corporate prayer from about 5 to 6.30. And then at 6.30, we would need to kind of shuffle out because uh, the young lady that cleans the church would have, needs to clean the church. But I'm wanting to let y'all know if it's okay, if that time's okay. Y'all, it, other people that are praying can come in any time you want. But I'd like to try to find a time where everybody could come. And I'm trying to think about the people that work. And I'm thinking 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 work. And I'm I just, want to, I just want y'all to be able to be part of that. Amen? So, so should we pray? Yes. We need to pray more. We can't pray enough. Should we fast? Absolutely, we should fast. But I, can I tell you something? God really does want to move. You, you know what I'm saying? You ain't, you ain't going to earn nothing with the Lord, but he's saying, but do you want me to move? 
I want to move, but do you want me to move? Amen. And I don't know about you, but I want him to move. I want him to move in my life. I want him to move in your life, but I really want him to move also in other people's lives. I want people to be set free from the lies of Satan. I want chains to be broken. I want people to be able to see the kingdom of God and to enter into the kingdom of God. I really do want that. Amen. And I believe you want it too. But look, after all the genealogy through chapters one through nine, we finally start getting into a little bit of a storyline in chapter 10. And listen, before there was ever a David, there was a Saul. I want you to know that. And again, I've already mentioned it before. Saul was not the will of God. Saul was the will of the people. They demanded at the time frame, at the end of the judges, they said, we want a king. Why? Because we want to be like the other, like the other people. They got kings. We ain't got no king. We just got all these judges. And really and truly, God had a king in preparation for them. If you read the story, it's real clear. God had young David. He was in the shepherd. He was in the field. He was writing psalms, singing to the Lord, killing bears, killing, killing lions, learning how to care with a compassionate heart for those little sheep so that he would be able to be a good king that God would be able to trust. He had his failure, and I don't have time to get into it, but it's interesting how Nathan corrected him, right? How Nathan the prophet came and told that story, but that's a good story. Y'all remember that story? Oh, man, look, he, I'm, I got to do it. I can't help myself. It's so good. Then Nathan the prophet shows up to the king after he's already sinned with Bathsheba and all this kind of stuff, and he's trying to hide everything. And Nathan the prophet shows up, and he says, and I, you know, one of the beautiful things about it is he, he threw a zinger on him, but the whole point to all this was to get David's heart right. Amen. God, I don't even know if Israel even really knew the whole backstory. I don't know that I'm ever told that. David knew, though, because he thought he was getting away with something. Guess what? The prophet came to him and said, hey, let me tell you a little story. Did I say this the other day? I think I feel like I did. Let me, t- let me tell you a little story. There was a, there was a man that was coming through town. Okay, and, and, and there was a rich man that knew him and wanted to kill a lamb and wanted to offer a, a meal for this gentleman. And the rich man had all kind of lambs. But there was this poor man that kind of lived right there by him, and he had power over that guy. Well, that poor man only had one little bitty old ewe lamb. So the rich guy says, hey, give me that lamb. So he took his only little ewe lamb, little baby lamb, and he offered his sacrifice, and he fed that traveler with that lamb. And David, like I could see his face getting red. And they already say he was ruddy, so I'm pretty sure he had like reddish hair, you know. And he's like, I could see him just flaming up. You ever seen a, red, a red-haired person mad? <laughs> and, so all, and all of a sudden he said, who is he? He's going to die. And Nathan the prophet says, you be that man. And then he begins to proceed to tell him, I took you from the sheep coat. The Lord starts speaking. I took you from the sheep coat. And I'm paraphrasing now, but I, I prepared you for such a time as this. And look what you've done. Oh, man, men fall. But look, praise God for David's heart that he loved the Lord, man. He laid on his face before the Lord and he cried out to God. And he said, please, Lord, restore me. Please, Lord, change me. Use me. Amen. And guess what? God used him. Praise God. All right. So, but before there was a David and God's working on this David. So David's a type of the spirit. There was a Saul. And look, you know how you know what the will of God is versus your will? I mean, we can look at our master and we don't need to look much further. You think that Jesus wanted to hang naked on the cross and slowly asphyxiate in the middle of the sun? I mean, as a man, do you think he wanted to endure that torture? Would you be all happy and skip up to the top of Calvary for that? No. But for the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross. Okay. But at the same time, what is he saying? He feels the pressure in Gethsemane. He's going through the greatest trial. And what does he say? Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass. Nevertheless. Oh. That's a good little conjunction right there, my friend. Let us hold on to that conjunction in our heart and in our mind. What are you talking about? Nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. See, one of the things about the word of God is when we begin to put this word in our heart, it becomes very clear whenever we're rebelling against God. Let us not be fooled. 
my friend. Each and every one of us in this room, we still have a sinful nature. The normal activity of a Christian is not supposed to be where the sinful nature is ruling and reigning in our heart and life. That's supposed to be dormant. Jesus, we died with Christ. We've been buried with him and resurrected to newness of life. We should no longer be under the bondage of sin by the grace of God. We should be able to walk in the victory that the Lord purchased for us. Amen. But let us understand that their tempter is never going to quit. And he'll learn, he'll constantly change in bait. I don't know how to fish, but I guarantee you, fishermen that know how to fish, they change bait. If they ain't biting on this today, they're going to pull that little green worm out of there. They're going to put a green worm on and look, the devil's just the same way. He's going to keep changing bait. Oh, you think you got a victory? Okay. You might have victory in this, but look, if you think he's going to quit on you, he ain't going to quit on you. He's going to keep trying to get you. But in the name of Jesus, this word right here. So what ends up happening is, listen to me, saints. When we put this word in our heart, let us understand something. It doesn't become so much confusion anymore. It's not so much, it can, there's always an element of deception, but the reality of it is, is that a lot of times it's rebellion and I'm preaching to the preacher. When we put this word in our heart and we know what this word says and it's very clear, oh, people will come up with all kind of monkey shine. People will try to twist stuff. And look, the society says, oh, this is normal behavior now. We found a genetic marker. You ain't found no genetic marker to talk about nobody was born like that. You ain't going to try to sit here and tell me that, that I was born an alcoholic because my daddy Jim was born an alcoholic. You ain't found a genetic marker. You just telling people a bunch of, a bunch of goobly goobly. No, yeah, I received some bad DNA from my daddy, but his name was Adam. And it's called sin. And that's the problem with the human race. And until we understand what he says about sin, and until we line up with what he says, I love that word confession in the New Testament, homologia. Y'all heard me talk about that before. Homa, same, logia, say. Say the same thing. Say the same thing as who? Say the same thing as God. What God says in our heart and in our mind to line up. And Lord, root out that spirit of rebellion out of every last one of us that we would, by your grace, be able to walk with you. Amen? Is that a good word? Praise God. That's a good word because we want, we all in this place want to live for the Lord. Amen. Amen. Praise God. So before there was a Saul, there was a a David. And again, Saul's type of the flesh and David's a type of the spirit. Why? Why is Saul a type of the flesh and David a type of the spirit? Because David was God's choice. Saul was the people's choice, right? So in Chronicles, first Chronicles chapter 10 is where the narrative starts, and then chapter 11 speaks about David. So look, real quick, let's go ahead and get into this. Let's just go ahead and read some of the words. Y'all with me? We still got a little bit of time. It's not going to be too much longer. Now the Philistines fought against Israel, and the men of Israel fled from before the Philistines and fell down slain in Mount Gilboa. And the Philistines followed hard after Saul and after his sons, and the Philistines slew Jonathan and Abinadab and Malchishua, the sons of Saul. And the battle went sore, got bad against Saul. And the archers hit him, and he was wounded of the archers. Then said Saul to his armor bearer, draw out your sword and thrust me through therewith, lest these uncircumcised come and abuse me. But his armor bearer would not, for he was very afraid. So Saul took a sword and he fell upon it. And when his armor bearer saw that Saul was dead, he fell likewise on the sword and died. So Saul died and his three sons and all his house died together. And when all the men of Israel that were in the valley saw that they fled and that Saul and his sons were dead, then they forsook their cities and fled. And the Philistines came and dwelt in those cities. And it came to pass on the morrow or the next day when the Philistines came to strip the slain, so they go and get all the stuff, they, that they found Saul and his sons fallen in Mount Gilboa. Now, I never noticed this before. We're going we're gonna to tie it all together at the end, but I want you to pay attention to this. And when they had stripped him, they took his head, Saul's head, they took his head and his armor and sent it into the land of the Philistines round about to carry tidings unto their idols and to their people. So there you go. Hey, look what we got. We got the head of the king right here, boy. Look at this. I want y'all to see this. We're the victorious warriors. We're the Philistines, the uncircumcised that they talk about us. Guess what? We won right here. 
And they put his armor in the house of their gods and fastened his head in the temple of Dagon. So there, that's the end of Saul's life right there. That's the, that's, the, that's the fruit of his life. And when all Jabesh Gilead heard all that the Philistines had done to Saul, they arose all the valiant men and took away the body of Saul and the bodies of his sons and brought them to Jabesh and buried their bones under the oak in Jabesh and fasted seven days. So Saul died for his transgression, which he committed against the Lord. If you'll remember, it's a long story, but he didn't kill Agag, who was an Amalekite. And in the Joshua story, I'm just saying, in Joshua, I think it's 13, whenever they go to spy the land, he said, the sons of Anak are there and we're like grasshoppers in their eyes. And Amalek lives there too. Agag comes many, many years later. God said, you need to kill him. You need to kill all of them. You need to kill their cattle. You need to kill their children. Well, golly, God, you sure do got a vendetta. That's right. They got Nephilim seed in them. They got Nephilim seed in them. What does that mean? Well, one day you hang around long enough, we'll talk about it. Okay, but what does it mean? It means that it's demonic. It means that you can't allow that to stay along the people of God. You and I can't, Paul said, we can't eat at the table of the Lord and also at the table of demons. We can't partake of both places. Lord, help us. Amen? He says, which he committed against the Lord, even against the word of the Lord, which he kept not. And also for asking counsel of one that had a familiar spirit. I mean, you can do what you want with this and you can get mad and you, whoever's watching on video, like I'm not trying to poke nobody in the eye. I'm really not. It's just my personality. I, but I don't think the Lord wants it all to change. I mean, he wants some things to change. I know that. But he don't want it all to change. He wants, he wants the truth spoken. You ought to not be reading no, no horoscope, dude. <laughs> Come on, man. You ought to not be getting nobody to read your tarot cards. Come on now. That's evil. That's witchcraft. You're not supposed to be engaging in that. That's what you call talking to familiar spirits. Saul went and found the witch of Endor. He talked to, give me, give me a word. Well, what do you, you don't want to go to a word from the prophet of God. You want to go, you want to go to some witch. You know why? Because God wasn't talking to him no more. Because look, God wants to talk to you. I know that what the enemy wants to tell you, the enemy wants to tell you, oh, no, you done messed up too bad. God ain't going to, no, 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 hold on. We're in New Testament grace. <laughs> Jesus, Jesus paid a high price for the Lord now to speak to us. Listen, we just got to get our head right. We got to get our heart right. And look, the Lord will restore us. Amen. All right. So he said, inquired not of the Lord, therefore he slew him and he turned the kingdom unto David, the son of Jesse. What a beautiful thing. Now, look, let's just read about four or five more verses. Chapter 11 talks about David. Then all Israel gathered themselves to David unto Hebron, saying, Behold, we are your bone and your flesh. D dude, this is so deep. I don't have, and this is supposed to be just a surface message. So deep. The people of God come to David and they connect themselves and say, We're your bone and your flesh. We're like your relatives. We're part of you. We're brothers. But what they're connecting themselves is the anointing. They're connecting themselves to the anointed of God. You hear me? Well, what are you talking about, preacher? I'm going to tell you what I'm talking about. There was a day whenever the prophet of God showed up. Samuel showed up in a little town called Bethlehem. Now, that was a big deal, my friend. The prophet of God showed up in a little bitty old town called Bethlehem. And he, you know what the Lord told Samuel? Get up. When are you going to quit mourning for Saul? Get up, fill your horn with oil, and I'm going to bring you to Bethlehem, and there you will find one of Jesse's boys, and you're going to anoint him to be my next king. And he said, and don't you look at his stature or his appearance, because man looks at the outward appearance. Man's always looking for something that shines and is bright and sounds right and dresses good and drives the right cars. And oh, man, yeah, that is so groovy. That just looks so right right there. No, no, no. Look, some of the stuff we see on Christian television, I ain't here to poke on nobody. I'm not going to say no names if the, unless the Lord says different. But look, they're they making it look all shiny and glitzy. And all, I keep reminding y'all, where was Jesus born? <laughs> He was born in a stable. And then, like, the word manger, it took me a while to learn. This one is actually the feeding trough. Okay, so they made a little bed for him in the feeding trough. So this is where the king of kings and the lord of lords was born. Right? So anyway, um, with all that said, David 
uh, they come to David and they say, listen, we want to serve you. You're our bone. You're our flesh. In other words, we're one. What, what a beautiful thing when, when brethren in unity dwell, whenever we're all of one mind and one accord and we're moving towards the things of God. And moreover, in time past, even when Saul was king, you were he that led out and brought in Israel. And the Lord your God said unto you, you shall feed my people Israel. I never did finish my story, but they, he, he goes to try to anoint all of these sons of Jesse and, and there's nobody left and it's not the right one. And then I don't know how they did it. I always like to kind of like imagine the story, but David, he said, oh, there's only one more, but he's like a little teenage boy and he's over there feeding the sheep. He's over there strumming his harp. He's over there killing lions. He's over there killing bears, he's becoming a man of God. Amen. So I don't know if they blew the shofar. I don't know how they called him, but he comes running in and I can imagine his red face. And then all of a sudden he's like, what's going on? The prophet showed up to Bethlehem. Oh, wow. What's going on? And then all of a sudden, mm, I could just see it, man. Samuel, he's the one. The Lord spoke to him. He's the one. And I can, I, what it, I don't even know what to imagine what it felt like for young David to have that oil poured on his head, that warm oil. You reckon he, he might have got slain in the spirit right there, right? Or at least fell to his knees when he realized his calling, right? Dude, that was powerful stuff. And look, as much as David's being blessed, oh, man, you reckon the jealousy and the envy, the lust of the flesh showing up in his brothers? I guarantee it did. I, I got proof of it, but we don't have time to get into that today. But look. He gets anointed by God. But look, from the time that he's anointed, it's all these years later that he's finally appointed. He's, he's been the one called by God, but the people of God, he's like, they, like, oh, we're just going to continue to serve Saul, and, and you're going to get what you asked for. You see, you ask for the flesh. God, let, let nobody be deceived. God will not be mocked. Whatever a man sows, that shall he reap. If a man sows to his flesh of his flesh, he will reap. And Saul sowed to the flesh. Saul did what it was that he wanted to do, and he reaped the flesh. All right. So God said unto thee, you shall feed my people Israel, and thou shalt be ruler over my people Israel. Therefore came all the elders of Israel to the king to Hebron, and David made a covenant with them in Hebron before the Lord, and they anointed David king over Israel according to the word of the Lord by Samuel. And David and all Israel went to Jerusalem, which is Jebus, where the Jebusites were, the inhabitants of the land. That ends up being actually, that's Jerusalem too. Okay, so I just want y'all to know that. Jebus is Jerusalem. The Jebusites were the inhabitants there. Look, this is what I like. This is, this is what you call an anointed king right here. Look what, he, look what happens. He says, and the inhabitants of Jebus said to David, you shall not come here. Nevertheless, David took the castle of Zion, which is the city of David. Isn't that something? They said, oh, you're not welcome here. You can't come here. No, I'm taking this because it don't belong to you. It belongs to the God I serve, and I've been anointed king, and now is my time, and I'm going to walk in the anointing that the Lord has called me to walk in. Amen? And David said, whosoever smites the Jebusites first shall be chief and captain. So Joab, the son of Zariah, went up first and was chief. And David dwelt in the castle, therefore they called it the city of David. Amen. So look, the people of God that will walk with the Lord, amen, God wants to bless them, right? So we already said this. We said that, that Judah, I must have gone back, let me, yeah, so chapter 10 was Saul, chapter 11 was David, and I said this, Saul's a type of the flesh, we've already covered that, David is a type of the spirit, Amen. So with that said, this is really the end of my message. And I just wanted to kind of bring you back, though, spiritually speaking. I saw something in that chapter 10 that I had never seen before. And I want to kind of share this with you in closing. I had never seen this before. And listen, it represents a theme that runs throughout the scriptures. It's very powerful. All right. Saul's head was brought to the temple of Dagon. And there it was fastened in there. Now, if you begin to understand some things about the head of the Old Testament and the Word of God, you understand that the head represents authority. It represents power. What happened in the Garden of Eden? God proclaimed that the head of the serpent would be crushed by the heel of the seed of the woman, which meant that ultimately Jesus would be born thousands of years later and he would destroy the power of the serpent. So there we have a type 
of the head, the authority of the enemy being destroyed. And then in this particular story, we're, we ha- we're dealing with Saul. This is so good. Don't, don't, don't just give me just a couple of minutes. This is so good. Or at least I believe it is. So Saul, in the beginning of his reign, you remember the people saying, we want a king. What is one of the first things Saul does? Y'all remember the story? He wants to go fight the Philistines. Y'all remember that? What does he do? He grabs the Ark of the Covenant. Remember that? Which represents the presence of God. And guess what? God wasn't with him. And what happened? The Philistines stole the Ark of the Covenant. Again, the Ark of the Covenant represents the presence of the Lord. What did the Philistines do with that Ark? Y'all remember? Put it in the Temple of Dagon. What happened whenever they put that Ark of the Covenant in the Temple of Dagon? The next day they go in there, what happened? Dagon done fell on his face and he's worshiping at the feet of the Ark of the Covenant. Now they lift him back up. This is just this is an idol. They lift him back up and they go about their business. And the next morning, what happened? They went in there. This time he's laying down. His head done broke off. His head and his hands broke off. His power and his work broken in the presence of the Lord. All right, now we fast forward a couple couple of decades, and what do we have? We got a young shepherd boy told by his daddy to go bring wine and cheese to the brothers on the battlefield, and we got a big old giant representing the enemy of God, and he starts slandering the people of God, and he says, won't you send a warrior out here to fight me, And and then if he wins, then we will serve you, and if I win, then you will serve us, and what happens? Nobody's willing. They're all cowering in the camp, and the little shepherd boy steps up and says, I will go fight this. I will go fight this uncircumcised Philistine, and y'all know the story. He hops down there. He picks up those five smooth stuff. Smooth stuff, 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 smooth stuff. David gathers up the sword of Goliath and takes the head of Goliath back to Jerusalem. That's what the Bible says. Now, I'm going to tell you right now, I believe that. Well, it says that. Of course, I believe it. But what I'm trying to say is this. I believe personally, and I can't prove this, that he was, I think by that time, that somebody, if he didn't have a horse, somebody gave him a horse right after that. You don't think they gave him? Son, take my horse, because you're a warrior. And I can see him on that horse. Again, I can't prove it. This is my commentary. Holding that head of Goliath up. He brought it to Jerusalem. Hold that out of Goliath, and look at this. Your God is victorious. Do you see this? Amen. And he also had the sword because later on he goes and he goes and finds the sword. So what are you saying? Seed of the, the head of the serpent destroyed in the garden is what we're told by the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. The presence of God knocking down Dagon and again breaking the head off this lying God, okay, in the temple of God. The servant of the Lord uh, walking in victory over the enemy and cutting that head off. And then what do the Philistines do? They turn around and they try and they do the very same thing. They take the head of Saul and they put it inside the temple of Dagon. And I just never saw that before. I think, and listen, it goes on because there's going to be a day, I believe personally, well, I don't believe this word. I believe it because it's the word of God. That there's going to be some people that are going to be caught up like Elijah. And there's going to be some people that are going to get their head cut off like John the Baptist. Because the word of God says it. And what I'm trying to say is this. Is that now I'm not trying to say people to get their head cut off are the bad guys. As a matter of fact, I'm trying to say the opposite because they're giving their life for the Lord. But what I'm trying to say is this. Is that there's a repeated theme within the scriptures that shows that, that this head of authority right? And David, a type of the spirit or one that walks in the spirit, wins the victory. Hallelujah. He wins the victory. And Saul, a type of the flesh, loses in the end. And that is the story of his life. What we need, amen, is to learn the word of God. Now, let me, let me tell you something. When I read that, I was like, oh my gosh, all of a sudden, out of nowhere. That might not even be a big deal to you, but to me, that is huge because I'd never seen it before. But can I tell you something? You, I couldn't have learned that just from a word of wisdom from another man telling me that. I'm just saying, like, 
I mean, I don't think that the Lord would speak that word of wisdom that way. You understand what I'm saying? Like, I can see Brother Kirk coming up, just wanted to let you know, Saul's head ended up. And what does that even mean? I mean, it's possible, but unlikely. No, it's years of working with the scriptures. It's years of study. It's years of desiring to know God's word. For the Lord to be able, when I see something like that, to make a connection, to download something like that. And again, to me, that's the kind of thing. Unfortunately for you, you got a pastor that's a word nerd. That's the kind of thing that excites me. To see these, these persistent types that are taking place. The word of God is so deep. The word of God is so relevant. The word of God in your heart. Listen to me, child of God. You put the word of God in there and he won't waste it. And it becomes power to you. And it becomes a compass to you. Because his word is a lamp unto your feet and it's a light unto your path. Father, we thank you, Lord. We want to give you glory and honor. I thank you, Holy Spirit, for your presence that was in this place even during the music. I thank you that you began to draw people by your spirit. Now, I want you to just come, go ahead and play us a song. I know we should always go, anybody that wants to come, the other musicians, if y'all want to come, we, we're going to close out in a song. Father, we just want to thank you for your presence. I, I'm so grateful that as we pray that the music would be anointed and that you would draw people to the altars. And that is what you're doing. And I just pray that you would continue to encourage your people to come to these altars, oh Lord God. Whether it's before the message, whether it's after the message, whether it's once, whether it's twice, Lord, just lead your people and let them know that at these altars, Lord God, it's a place of brokenness. It's a place where we bring ourselves to humble ourselves and that we cry out to you and we begin to ask you to work in our hearts and in our lives. And so Lord, I pray that even now as we begin to play this song and worship you, for just a couple more minutes before we leave, Lord, that your presence would minister, Lord. And I pray that you would remind us from your word, Lord, that we are your people, that you have a people on this earth and we're part of that. Lord, I pray that you would remind us that we are kings and priests in Christ and that, Lord, we have authority and victory upon this earth. Lord, remind us to walk in the spirit and not in the flesh. And Lord, we ask you to give us the grace and the strength that we need to serve you. In Jesus' name, amen. Hallelujah.